Hello, and welcome to the series of videos on the microprocessor. My name is Bhaskaran, and I'm going to be the faculty that walks you through this fairly detailed program on understanding the 8086. What I will cover is a little bit of fundamentals on microprocessors in general, zoom down very quickly into the 8086, talk about the architecture of the 8086, its instruction sets, so on and so forth, talk about various peripheral devices that you need to work with the 8086 effectively. Peripheral devices like the 8279, the 8251, 8059, so on and so forth. And of course, what I will not cover are facts, figures, things that are fairly simple to understand that do not need any conceptual explanation. Those you'll find in any book or any website, so on, that's not what I'm going to be touching upon. Now, most of the programs or the videos that I will, I will be recording are self-contained. That means one video will cover one logical chunk of information. In some cases, I would be forced to split it over multiple videos. And in fact, the longest one of them all will be split across four different videos. But each of the videos will still stick to one logical piece of information. So let's look at the, the history of microprocessors. The first microprocessor uh, was really a, called the Tomcat and was made for the De Department of Defense USA. But the first world's commercially available microprocessor was the 4004. This came from Intel, was a four-bit processor, and contained a grand old number of 2,300 transistors. This was state of the art at that time. And what is that time? I'm talking about November 15th, 1971, when was, this was first launched. Today's processors have excess of 6 billion transistors. That's the advance that you've seen over the last 30 years. The 4004 ran at 740 kilohertz. Today's processors are run at an excess of 3.2 gigahertz. And if you were to think of where we have gone from four bits, today, state of the art is 64 bits, even on your mobile phone. The picture that you see on the screen here is a depiction of, is an actual image, of the 4004. If you remove the golden foil, what you see is the picture at the bottom. And if you were to actually even remove the heat sinks and look at it through a microscope, you would see the architecture of the 4004 with all its connecting wires as depicted in this picture. So what is a microprocessor? The heart of the microprocessor is called the central processing unit. And the central processing unit consists of a set of registers, it consists of what's called the control unit, and it consists of what's called the arithmetic logic unit. All of this together is called the CPU. But this is not the entirety of the processor. The CPU has in addition certain memory units, so registers and so on and so forth in excess of this. It could have a bus interface unit, and only when all of this is together, packaged in one nice looking package, do you call this a microprocessor? A microprocessor on its own has no meaning. You need to connect input devices, devices like a keyboard, like a mouse, a joystick, so on and so forth. And you need to have various output devices. So output devices, again, various forms. You, typical ones, the monitor, of course, and a printer. Together, this becomes a computing system, a computer. And you will see the similarity between this and your personal computer at home. It has a CPU, it has memory, it has input devices, and it has output devices. So how does the processor connect to the external world? Very simple, it has three kinds of buses that come out. A bus is a configuration that contains many wires of a similar kind. So you've got the address bus, data bus, and a control bus. Each of these are connected to either memory devices, to various interface devices, or to IO ports. If you take an interface device, 
Let's take an input device, like a keyboard. So a keyboard that's connected to an interface device, you would see from this diagram that the data bus flows into the processor. On the other hand, if you had an output device like a monitor or an LCD display, LED display, you would have the data bus come out of the processor into this output device. This in itself is not enough. So while you have the address bus and the data bus, et cetera, connected to this, you need to have something called an address decoder. How does the processor know that it is the keyboard or the display that it is talking to? And the address decoder helps you do that. The address decoder takes address lines from the processor, takes read signals and write signals from the processor, decodes it accordingly, and triggers the various peripheral devices that you have connected to it. The last piece that I would like to end today with is on the kinds of languages that a processor can understand. Really, at the top, you have what are called high-level languages. And these are C, C++, Java, so on and so forth. And many of you would be familiar with these kinds of languages. But this language is not something that the processor can understand. What you need to do is then to compile it. And when you compile it or interpret it, you come down to what are called assembly-level languages. Assembly level languages are very processor specific. So an 8086 has its own assembly language. It cannot be understood by processors from other manufacturers. But the assembly language also cannot be understood by the processor. The assembly language has to be assembled. And only after it is assembled by an assembler do you get what is called machine code or opcodes. And it is these machine codes and opcodes that are understood by the processor. So why do you have this gamut of languages, this hierarchy of languages? The reason is that the high-level languages are closer to English and can be understood by the human being, whereas the opcodes are just a series of ones and zeros. A human being finds it extremely difficult to handle a series, a, bit, a string of ones and zeros. For a computer, for a microprocessor, it is in its natural state. It loves ones and zeros. And that's why you need this hierarchy of languages. This brings me to the end of the introductory session on microprocessors. In my next video, I'm going to be talking about the architecture of the 8086 and its various modes of operation. Till then, I would urge you to read up a little bit more about the concepts that I've just spoken about and the tons of material out there. And you can compare this with a family of processors within a manufacturer like Intel or across manufacturers like Intel and AMD. You'll get a lot of insight into why processors are designed the way that they are. Till then, happy reading. Thank you very much.